Welcome to another edition of Against the Current. We're coming to you from Freedom Summit 2018 in suburban Chicago, our annual AM560 gathering of conservatives uh, come together each year to hear from conservatives of national profile in the context of electoral politics. And we're pleased to have as our guest on this edition, somebody who certainly fits that description. He is longtime Milwaukee County Sheriff David Clark. The, the author of the book, Cop Under Fire. Sheriff Clark, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Dan, it's my pleasure to be on with you. Thanks. I'll tell you what, so you're a um, Milwaukee County Sheriff for 15 years, so that's a, a good spell of time in electoral politics. How has electoral politics changed over the 15 years that you were an office holder and now as a spokesman for America First Action PAC? Well, not really that much. Um, it's gotten a, a lot more vitriolic, but, you know, my races always were. Uh, I was I ran four times for sheriff, was elected four times, all tough uh, fights in the primary mainly. And, uh, you know, it's the face of politics today, really. And I don't, I, I don't see it getting any better much sooner. So this is the environment we have, and uh, you got to survive in it. What did you learn from running uh, in Milwaukee County for those not familiar, Milwaukee County is sort of like Cook County, Illinois, three to one, Democrat to Republican. Uh, yet Scott Walker was elected Milwaukee County executive before being elected governor. And you were repeatedly elected Milwaukee County sheriff. What, uh, so that's uh, two pretty conservative um, stand and deliver guys in a overwhelmingly Democrat area. Uh, lessons that uh, Republicans in Cook County and around the country could learn from your electoral experience and your your colleague Scott Walker's. Yeah, well, we both came in uh, probably simultaneously. There was an uproar in Milwaukee County government, a pension scandal, where uh, county supervisors and the county executive awarded themselves and other uh, county employees what they called a backdrop upon retirement, totaling millions of dollars for you know years of service plus your pension. So we came in on a mandate of change. And obviously, when, when there's a mandate from the electorate for change, they kind of issue whether it's conservative, liberal, Democrat, Republican. I think much like what uh, happened with President Donald Trump. And they just want to see a different way. Uh, as a law enforcement professional, I was 24 years with the city of Milwaukee Police Department before I became sheriff. Uh, law and order was huge. I was big on that. Um, tough on crime, that's important. And those things transcend, you know, race, they transcend gender, socioeconomic status. People want to be safe. And I had a strong message of, of being on the side of victims and not criminal, criminal perpetrators. So deep down inside, even people who may not have liked some of my other uh, politics or positions on things, they, they kind of knew that, hey, this guy's a ball buster when it comes to crime. And uh, this is the kind of guy we want uh, as a sheriff. So uh, let's ask the same question about law enforcement and the environment for police since you're a career police officer before being a Milwaukee County Sheriff that we asked about politics. How's that changed, being a police officer in this country in an urban uh, center like Milwaukee, like Chicago, like New York, like L.A. over the last 15 years? Yeah, what's happened to the profession of policing as well as, as local law enforcement agencies, we've been dragged into the political arena. Okay, We didn't ask to be. Uh, most of the time, if you talk to cops, you know, you kind of come through the career being told, you know, stay out of politics, just do your job evenly across the board, enforce the law, uh, regardless of politics. But this, this profession came under attack. And uh, like I said, we were dragged into the political arena, uh, whether we wanted to be or not. So I think what be became important, at least for me as an elected law enforcement executive, was to defend the profession. Okay, be that voice that the, uh, the the law enforcement officer on the front line doesn't have. If we're going to tell them, hey, stay out of the politics and just do your job, someone's got to speak up for them. And that's what I thought I saw my role as. And that's really where you increased your profile is, you know, you felt you, whether you got dragged in or not, once you're in, then you're going to have your say. Sure. I mean, as an elected official, as a law enforcement executive, um, a little different, you know, I, I, I really thought when I first got elected, maybe naively so, that they would just want me to do my job, right? Keep the peace, force the law, lock up bad guys. And I learned early on that um, 
because you're an elected official, they weren't going to let you do that. They're going to come to you, they meaning uh, certain segments of the public, especially the media, are going to come to you with questions about things that, you know, I don't really even come into play with law enforcement. I'm talking about social issues. I'm talking about things that are important to people, but uh, not so much to law enforcement. And so what I learned early on was I was either going to have to learn the political end of this job of being the elected sheriff or I wasn't going to survive. And your decision to uh, uh, fold in with President Trump and be such an outspoken supporter of Donald Trump, the candidate, before he became president. Yeah, I, uh, I, I saw a little of me in him. I did. Uh, I was very high profile and outspoken in Milwaukee County. Uh, obviously, Milwaukee County is a county of about a million people, very diverse, like you said, blue collar, um, urban county, and a lot of the problems that urban counties have. So, you know, I, I had to, I took that and I looked and I saw President Trump. I met him several years before he announced that he was running for president, but uh, I liked his position on supporting the American law enforcement officer. This profession had undergone just a thorough beating. Uh, a PR beating at the hands of cop haters. So one of the things that President Trump early on uh, after he announced his campaign and all throughout the campaign and even throughout today, his defense of the American law enforcement officer. All right, that's important, uh, especially coming out of a period of time where we had what I call the cop hater in chief inside the, the, the White House, Barack Obama. Now, he didn't like cops. There's no doubt about that. I can prove that. That's not just... Uh, uh, you know, hot air for me. I mean, this is a guy who, early on in his administration, the situation out in Cambridge, Cambridge Massachusetts, okay, with uh, the Cambridge police and his friend, Dr. Gates, and mm -hmm. make a long story short, they had to arrest Dr. Gates because he wouldn't cooperate. That's one of the, the, the biggest things cops face on the street today. People won't comply with lawful commands. So he gets there with his huge platform. He's the president of the United States dipping down into local law enforcement, which most presidents didn't do and, and don't do. They leave that to the elected, the, the local officials. And he said the police acted stupidly in arresting, uh, you know, his friend. Um, and then you, you look at the fact that he ended the 1033 program, which was a federal program that allowed local law enforcement agencies to buy surplus military equipment. Military equipment that's going to keep them safe, ballistic shields, um, uh, ballistic vests, ballistic helmets, and uh, many of these agencies can't afford that stuff in the normal budget. So this was very helpful. It was an officer safety issue um, that law enforcement agencies depended upon. It takes away safety equipment, you know. And then, then I look at some of the things that he said, you know, in relation to some of the uh, the other um, incidents. Eric Garner, for instance, out of New York. Freddie Gray. Uh, look what he said about Trayvon Martin. Um, you know, which wasn't a police case, but if I had a son, he'd look like Trayvon Martin. I thought that was insulting. I thought it feeds into that that um, ugly sentiment that all black people look alike. I mean, that's what that sounded like, you know, that he'd he look like my son. How, do you know, how does he know what his son would look like? But anyway, uh, some of the things that he did in support of Black Lives Matter, which are straight-up cop haters. Black Lives Matter is a straight-up cop-hating movement, and he gets in bed with them. He invites them to the White House. He has them sit in on on this uh, 21st century police reform commission, you know. And so I look at these things, and that's why I say, and I can, and, and I'll stand on it, that he's a straight-up cop hater. So Donald Trump comes in, President Trump, and takes a different position. He right? doesn't get so much involved in some of these local police issues with the use of force, uh, but he continues to, to articulate his unwavering support for the men and women that... Uh, put on the badge and uniform and go out and risk their lives to, to make the community safer places. How did you deal with uh, Black Lives Matter in Milwaukee? I went straight at them. Okay, I, I called them out for what they were. I knew what was going on there. Um, they were part of this anarchist movement. All right, they didn't start that way, but their premise uh, was built on a lie. And that's what I mean when I went right at them. Hands up, don't shoot. Really spawned the Black Lives Matter movement. Hands up, don't shoot was a lie. And therefore, I said that movement's illegitimate because its, its premise was based on a, a lie. And then they continued to, to use uh, false statistics. They, they continued to 
uh, manipulate statistics. They, they, they made claims that law enforcement officers are bloodthirsty, that they, uh, you know, they hunt down young black males as if it's some sort of sport, some very ugly things uh, that they had to say. And, um, you know, I, I looked at Black Lives Matter, too. I said, you know what? You know who really cares about black life? The law, law enforcement officer who goes out every day, risks their lives to protect good, law-abiding black people. You know, the overwhelming majority of, of black people in these struggling ghettos are black. I mean, they're poor and, and whatnot, but uh, they deserve to be kept safe. I didn't see Black Lives Matter down there keeping them safe. The city of Chicago, you know, here near where we are today, I didn't see them in Chicago this summer and last summer with the violent summer they t they've had you know, trying to keep the peace and, and work with the police and work with the community, so on and so forth, uh, became a political construct. That's all it was to to uh, gin up uh, black turnout for the 2016 election. What about uh, President Obama's decision to get involved since you brought up Ferguson, the consent decree for the Ferguson police, the effort to impose a consent decree in Chicago that's been walked back by the Trump administration, but now locally because of the Chicago, you know, the Chicago Democrats in charge want to impose this on, on themselves, regardless of uh, federal government or Department of Justice oversight. Those consent decrees, that effort to, to do two things. One, have police departments concede they're systemically racist. And two, uh, micromanage the police from D.C. Yeah, and I, I really pushed back against that. Um... I think the Obama administration, Department of Justice, was 21 of 22. In other words, when they started um, these these consent decree investigations, civil rights, whatever they called it, they did it 22 times, and 21 times they found the department or agency guilty of some sort of, uh, I don't know, racism, whatever. I mean, I mean, in Chicago, too, I mean, just the context, I'm sure you can share a similar uh, story in Milwaukee. Of the 12,000 officers in Chicago, half are black or Latino, yeah. half are minorities. So you're telling me 12,000 people, half of whom are minorities, are part of an organization that, according to these reports, uh, dispenses with concern for the lives of minorities in the city, minorities they police, they protect and serve, that they're systemically racist against uh, people that uh, share their same racial or ethnic composition. Right. See, that's why I said it doesn't hold water. It doesn't pass the eye test. It doesn't pass the smell test. Um, they make these claims. They know that they're incendiary. Uh, they know that uh, the police really can't fight back. Many of the uh, members of the political class in those communities will not fight back. I, I encouraged the mayor of uh, Ferguson at the time to push back against this stuff. He and I had a conversation, and uh, he didn't like the way that the investigation was going. I'm talking about the, the civil rights uh, thing and right. the way they skew statistics and manipulate statistics, exploit statistics. They go by anecdotal evidence. Some guy says, I was stopped for driving while black with no evidence that that, that it actually even happened or that it was for that reason, because I know it's not. And um, you know, so you look at this, and, and they're getting involved. The feds know nothing about local policing. Local policing is a lot different than the, the, they do at the federal level. That's why the federal level has investigative agency. The FBI is, is an investigative agency. Okay, They're not down in the community every day forming relationships, dealing with the complexities of these um, uh, dysfunctional environments, and they are dysfunctional environments. And so they want to come now and, and tell the local communities, the local police agency, how to police in their, commu their own community, where they live, where they work every day, where they have relationships. And, you know, I looked at that and, and I just said, you know, this is tying the hands of the law enforcement officer. What it has led to, the law of unintended consequences, this stuff always happens. The law of unintended consequences was that the police became less assertive. If you have a high crime, a uh, high violent crime situation in, in your community, you have to go at it assertively with, with law enforcement. That's just that's, that's one angle, but that's what we do. Okay, all this other happy, feel good stuff, warm and fuzzy, some other social service agency can do. But what we do, what we're trained to do is keep the peace, arrest people for violations of the law, 
and um, you know try to give people some sense anyway that uh, they're going to be safe within their community. I mean, you look at all the the, the crimes with the drugs, the drive-by shootings, the gangs. These gangs are in control of many of these neighborhoods, and that's what happened in the city of Chicago. So they come in, they get the police to not be as assertive as they need to be, and the next thing you know, the criminal element is in charge, and when you see that happen, crime goes up, innocent people get killed, kids get killed in drive-by uh, shootings, uh, people live in fear in their own uh, neighborhood, and the feds don't take that into account. They tie law enforcement officers up under a consent decree. Everything has to be reported. Everything has to be approved before they can do it. So, you know, if, if, if you tie the hands of a law enforcement officer with report, report writing to satisfy the statistics that they want to gather, the feds, and all they're going to do in the end when they gather these statistics, they're going to turn around and club you over the head with it, misusing them. Well, look, you stopped... 30 cars of black guys in this area and only, you know, one car with a white driver when it's a black area. Who do you think is driving cars in those areas? So it's misusing statistics. It's very expensive. And they'll give you a little money, but uh, it keeps the officer off the street. We need a visible presence in these neighborhoods to send a signal to the bad guy. Every time that bad guy looks up, he's got to see a squad car. And it also gives the community a sense of confidence. Hey, they're here. They're going to protect us. That's gone when the officer's tied up writing reports and when they're not as a service they need to be. So as, as a local practitioner, but with uh, a national perspective, we have uh, just recently New York, first weekend in 25 years, no homicides. Uh, but we have, after Freddie Gray in Baltimore, uh, violent crime spikes. We have Chicago, obviously, uh, still beset with violence, more homicides per capita in Chicago than L.A. and New York combined with one quarter of the population, staggering. So um, in terms of thinking about best practices, why is violent crime on the rise in places like Chicago and Baltimore when it's on the wane in places like New York and to a lesser extent L.A.? Yeah, well, let's take New York to start with. First of all, they have a, a resource that most agencies don't have. It's a uh, Human resources, all right, boots on the ground, cops on the front line. You know, they got 30,000, 35,000 cops. Uh, they can just throw cops at a problem, and for the most part, they can clean it up. But here's another thing that they have going for them. They have a plan to reduce violence, all right? They operate on the broken windows theory, okay? Uh, that thing works. It started in New York. Uh, it might have some minor tweaks since uh, Bill Bratton and Jack Maple started it, but basically, you know, they, they led the, the, the country with a stop and frisk, which is, has been ruled by the Supreme Court. And the reason why I mention the Supreme Court, I'm talking about the rule of law, not the rule of some angry mob. And the Supreme Court has opined on stop and frisk and said, yeah, if narrowly defined, you know, for, to, to, for government to complete a, a particular task uh, that they're responsible for. Yeah, you can use that practice. Now you have to monitor it. Okay, now you look at Baltimore. By the way, noted criminologist Kanye West disagrees that stop and frisk is effective. Or yeah, important. yeah. He ought to come down, and that was one of the things that I said after his visit to the White House, I got to ask about, and I said, yeah, I don't have any problem with that. But he needs to come down here at street level now and see what it's really like. He can't just go to lunch at the White House and then run back to his mansion, you know, where everything is nice and calm and peaceful. But anyway, you know, getting back to Baltimore, uh, the social order collapsed in Baltimore. Uh, high levels of poverty, obviously. The political class is dysfunctional in Baltimore. The police don't have the support that they need. They don't have the numbers. Uh, boots on the ground, uh, the number of cops. They're running these cops ragged with, instead of increasing the ranks uh, by hiring more people, they're trying to get it done on overtime. Well, you're just burning these cops out. That's all you're doing. So you look at that, you look at Chicago, the Laquan McDonald thing. Yeah, ugly situation, no doubt about that. But this is not a perfect world. You don't take an entire police department, you know, like they did in Baltimore, and throw it under the bus over one incident. If there's a problem, go ahead and fix it. Hold people accountable. I'm all for that. I've had to fire cops, okay? There's just certain things. And that was known about me as a sheriff of Milwaukee County, at least in my organization, would not put up with abuse, would not put up with violating uh, people's constitutional rights, because we don't have to do that to get this job done. 
Uh, but that's the job of the chief, that's the job of the sheriff to do that sort of thing. Um, so th I think that's the difference there. Chicago could probably use more officers. Uh, you know, I've talked to some uh, people from the uh, Fraternal Order of Police in Chicago, and uh, they believe that they, uh, uh, they need more cops. There's a formula you use, um, you know, to hire cops. You don't just pull a number out of the air and say, let's hire 500. You know, you look at the crime rate, and you look at not just the crime rate, crime rate, but you look at some of the other dysfunctions in those areas. What's the poverty rate? What's the unemployment rate? You know, you look at those sorts of things, and then you make a determination. Well, if we're going to do this, we need X amount of cops, and we hope to achieve this. And, you know, with that plan, and it has to have deliverables. In other words, there has to be outcomes. If you hire 500 cops, and in two, three years, because it's not going to go over way overnight, two, three years, the crime rate has not even leveled. Maybe you didn't hire enough, but maybe your plan needs to be adjusted as well. So I understand that there's a lot of dollars <coughs> behind this sort of thing, and it has to be watched, but I don't think that um, you can short change yourself on cops uh, just to save a few dollars. So civilian worth. political leadership and backing and manpower are two variables that you can kind of compare and contrast in different uh, communities, different regions. What about uh, an X factor that doesn't get talked about, in my opinion, enough in Chicago, Cook County, the other side of the criminal justice system? prosecutors and judges. Uh, we've got a real problem that uh, is becoming more understood in Cook County with a uh, you know, revolving door yeah. system of justice and people that commit multiple violent crimes that are released or given light sentences uh, or not prosecuted in the first place. And so, I mean, you had the statement that was made by Chicago police about a year ago, sort of remarkable statement. There's about 1,500 to 2,000 people in Chicago who we know are likely to murder somebody or be murdered. I mean, so it's sort of like police have the knowledge, but it's inert because it's not going to be acted upon, can't be acted upon by them because of the civilian political leadership problem. And it's not going to be acted upon in, at the prosecutorial level when a case is made against these individuals we know are likely to be recidivist violent criminals. Yeah, yeah this is... A huge part of the problem, you know. First, what I talked about before, what you were asking, you got to have the resources in place. And then once you have the resources, you have to have a plan. What they did in New York, what they continue to do in New York, which uh, some other areas did, but some still don't do, is there has to be a connection between the police department, the prosecutor's office, the state department of probation and parole, and the court system. Okay, they all have to be working not against each other, but in concert with one another. In other words, if a cop makes an arrest of a long-term career criminal, a violent guy, and he enters into the prosecutor's office, and, and you see, the prosecutor's office in many of these areas is, is under the stranglehold of these, these starry-eyed, crazy liberals about changing human behavior. Okay, if a guy is, let's say, 26 years old, he's been arrested 17 times for some pretty serious stuff, but he hasn't murdered yet, so he's not in prison. May have done a little time for some of his stuff, but not a lot. He has no education. He didn't finish high school. There's no work history. There's not a lot to work with there, but they seem to think that if you take a guy like that, and I call them career criminals because that's what they do for a living, and it's deeply ingrained human behavior now. They're hardwired to do it. It's very difficult to undo that once it becomes hardwired. So they take that guy, they think if they get him into a job training program, where well, he doesn't have the discipline to go to work every day. He doesn't have the discipline to be productive when he gets there. He doesn't offer anything to an employer. What's job training going to do? That guy needs to be locked up and separated from law-abiding society. So see, when, when, you, when you don't do that or you, you, you're going to go soft and put him on probation, now the Department of Probation and Parole kicks in. All right? They have a lot of authority um, um, that, you know, cops can't do, that courts can't do. In other words, they can go search a probation and parolee's apartment without a search warrant. The cops can't do that. So what they did in New York, in part, they got the prosecutors on board and made the case, hey, when we arrest these guys, if it's like the number you said, there's 200 core bad guys. We got to keep these guys locked up for the longest period of time by law. So then the prosecutor knows that, and the prosecutor in off in, in, in New York, the prosecutor's office set up a uh, um, 
um, you know, broken windows type thing. But when these guys come in, the name is flagged, and they go, ah, this guy's been in here two, three, four times in the last year. This is a guy we got to follow through the system. And then you have to have the courts on, on board. You know, where they're not going to turn these guys loose on low bail, watered down sentences in exchange for plea bargains. And so if they're all, and that's what happened in New York, they all start working together instead of against each other. Uh, you can make a difference, but that's not going on in Chicago. It's not going on in Milwaukee either. It's one of the things I railed about. You know, I said, these guys are, cops make an arrest. These guys are out quicker than, the, the, before the ink dries on police reports. And that's not just a saying, it's true. So if the cops can arrest people till the cows come home, it doesn't matter. And what, what matters is what the prosecutor does with them, what the court system does with them, what probation and parole does with them. You know, probation and parole can... Uh, make the guy, you know, he has a history of drug use or, or, or drug dealing, take urine tests frequently, all right? I mean, so there's certain things they're not doing in Chicago. I know why, uh, because they're, 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 they've been caught up with this, uh, um, you know, soft, not using jails and prisons for uh, crime control. Jails and prisons are a very effective crime control tool. Well, and the other thing, and Heather McDonald points this out in her book, War on Cops, too, it was sort of the um, kind of let's get some hard facts out in contravention to the silly headed sentimentality of the left. Only 40 percent of convicted felons serve any prison time at all in the first place. So you're talking you mean you really have to try to get to prison. Um, you know, if you're if you're in prison, then you're probably there for a good reason. Yeah. And also the sort of the, the silliness with which the way this is talked about. So like nonviolent criminals and violent criminals, like if somebody um, is um, a rapist? Well, um, well, he, that doesn't. He's not. He, he doesn't do drugs. He just rapes. He's, he really focuses on raping people, but he doesn't do drugs. And the, well, that's such a silly way to talk about it. Of course, we know that violent criminals are engaged in all kinds of criminal conduct. So, if you know, if somebody is a is violent over here, but you can get them by the imposition of stiff penalties for drug related crimes, then you do it. Yeah. But but that's not how it works because everything is so kind of airy about um, criminal justice reform and reducing recidivism Social rates and job training programs and all this stuff. And I'm all for a second chances and people want to turn their life around and all that. But let's distinguish who has, on an individual basis, who really has the ability to turn their life around and who doesn't. So, you know, Kanye West talking about... Uh, commuting the sentence of Larry Hoover is insane. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah. But, 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 but yeah. giving somebody who made a mistake or got off on the wrong track in life early and learned the hard way and now really truly does want to chart a different course in his life, fine, I'm game for finding yeah. a, a path for a second chance. The best, the best area to have that sort of difference is in the juvenile justice system. Okay, you look at a lot of these people in the juvenile justice system are committing some very serious, violent crimes, okay? You and we're talking what? about like fourth, fifth, sixth grade level. Yeah, you know, when I grew up, uh, you know, your toilet paper trees, for instance, right? Maybe a little graffiti, right? I mean, that was a juvenile uh, sort of nuisance. Right. And that's not the case anymore. This right. is a, a different breed of, of, of juvenile that uh, is engaging in violent behavior. So if you don't nip it there, I mean, it's the best. It's not hardwired in yet. That's the best chance to have it. We spend too much money on the other end and too much time with people who have been for the last 10, 15 years doing nothing but committing and engaging in, in, in criminal activity. So um, that, that's why it, 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 the revolving door, it, this is, this, we're our own worst enemy in some of this, but we're losing the narrative as well because you mentioned violent versus nonviolent crime. It's amazing how the left continues to move the goalposts on what's a violent crime and what's not. Because I maintain burglary is a violent right. crime. That terrorizes people. Can you imagine? And I've had to do this. I've got calls to burglaries. You co people come home, their business or their, their home's been invaded and turned upside. These people are stunned. They're in shock. They're, they're, they're terrorized by this. So, you know, they, they sleep with the light on at night now because it, it alters your, your, your behavior. It's a quality of life. Your issue. sense of safety. Exactly. Where if you can't feel safe in your home, where can you feel safe? Well, they lose that for a while, right? So, by the way, burglary and auto theft are gateway crimes. That if you look at most juvenile histories, and early in their, their their young adult life when they get eighteen, 
the first arrest for burglary and auto theft. So those are gateway crimes. So we ought to start cracking down on burglary and auto theft. And I don't mean taking a, a 15 year old steals a car and put him in, 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 a, in a, a juvenile prison for 10 years. I'm not talking about right. that. But you can't just send him home with probation. You can't do that, okay? So they keep moving the goalposts on what's violent and what's not violent. You know, if a guy steals a car and leads police on a high-speed chase and gets caught, well, they think it's not a violent crime. Yes, it is. You know how many people's lives he endangered, including the cops? That is a violent crime. So how we classify these things is where we're losing it, too. You know, drug dealing, per se, is not a violent crime. Well, it is if I'm selling you dope and you're out holding up convenience stores to be able to buy that dope then what I'm engaged in is a violent crime. But see, we won't look at it like that. If there isn't some gun, even gun possession, the left will say, well, yeah, he was caught with a gun, but he didn't use it. So therefore, it's not a violent crime. You see what I mean? Right. And, and, and the, the criminal justice system is falling for this crap. You know, the, the, the prosecutors got all these programs, the court system, same thing. And, you know, these guys are always just on the cusp of turning their life around before this thing happened, right? All that... That nonsense. But um, this is doable. New York did it. They were averaging 2,100 homicides per year before uh, the the uh, quality of life enforcement and broken windows under Bratton Giuliani and Jack Maple. They're now down into below uh, below 200. Can yeah, you imagine over the and, and Heather McDonald? You mentioned said this over that time period from the time that broken windows came in to today. She estimates 10,000 young black men are alive today because you think if they were losing 2,100 a year and it's down to 200, do the math, right? You know, this sort of stuff uh, saves lives. But in New York, the big thing is they were making sure these guys who were the no-good nicks, who were the, the constant problem, that they stayed locked up. Very few places are doing that, including my county, Milwaukee County. After, so after a career as a police officer and then 15 years as Milwaukee County Sheriff, why the decision to step away from that and uh, get uh, full on into the political arena? Uh, new mission. Uh, you know, I had 40 years in law enforcement. That's a good long career. Uh, that's enough. It, it was time to to do something else. And you know, when I saw what was happening to President Trump, I worked hard to get President Trump elected. I, I, I was engaged in the campaign. I was being used in the campaign, messaging. I was traveling all over the country. Spoke at the RNC. Yeah, speaking on behalf of uh, you know his agenda and his vision. This is before he got elected. And when I saw what was happening with this resistance movement, because I really thought when the election was over, I was asked the, the night before the election in uh, North Carolina. We were in North Carolina, Raleigh. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then candidate Trump showed up. This is a Monday before the Tuesday election. I'm one of these stops and. Um, uh, the campaign had asked if I wanted to come to New York the following night to watch the returns. And they said, we'll get you there, we'll fly you there, we'll put you up. And I just said, I'm going home. I did what you asked me to do. I'm going home. <laughs> it's just time to go home. So I went home, watched the election return. It was, uh, you know, I, I thought Donald Trump was going to win all along. I would said that. I, I had a podcast at the time, and I'd say it every week. He's going to win this nomination. He's going to be the president. But I really thought I'd go back and just finish off being the sheriff. But when I saw this resistance movement happening, I said, I can't do this. I helped this guy get elected, and i got to help him stay there. Some opportunities presented themselves uh, for me to do this full time. It's a new mission now. I'm still on it. And so I, I jumped at it because um, I just decided after being in law enforcement 40 years, I want to be a foot soldier for freedom and liberty here in America. And so you're bouncing around the country uh flacking for candidates, supporting candidates. You plan to do this through the 2020 reelect? Probably, because there's no end to this. There's no finish line to what we're trying to do here. Um, you know, in, in, in getting back to this America that uh, the founding fathers intended and improving on it, and we have improved on it. So it doesn't have to be the same like it was in 1700s when I say that, but Right. Theirs was about freedom and liberty, keeping government out of the way, government restrained, all those sorts of things, which is not today. So uh, the president's made it clear. He said, I need more Republicans in the Congress. Uh, so they have me doing that sort of thing. I'm speaking to a lot of GOP groups all across the country, uh, energizing them, uh, instilling a sense of urgency that this job's not done, that 2016 
didn't 2016 was the start not the finish and that's how I see 2018 is a continuation um, because it, it takes more than one election cycle for this sort of change that this country has undergone um, to take place and so we've got this coming up in 2018 and right after that it's into 2020 uh, it's going to be busy for a while but I'm having fun all right he is one of the Midwest finest one of Milwaukee's finest former Milwaukee County Sheriff David Clark the author of the book cop under fire and now a spokesman for America First Action PAC, coming to a congressional district or, s or Senate race near you, and then a presidential race in 2020. Sheriff Clark, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it. My pleasure. My website is americasheriff.com. americasheriff.com. David Clark.